Good afternoon. I am delighted that you're here. I'm tickled. Uh, I'm going to, this is the short version of the message uh, that I deliver here, and I'm going to move real fast. You're going to have a lot of images coming at you, and you're going to hear a lot of information. So uh, strap into your seats, hold on, because it's going to go rapidly. The name of my presentation is A Face-to-Face -face Encounter with Jesus. I ask the question, because that's what we're talking about when we talk about the Shroud of Turin. It's either a man who was crucified exactly like Jesus Christ, or it's Jesus Christ himself. Those are the two options. That's what I'm going to give you to start this message today. It is not a hoax. It's not a fake. It's not a forgery. I don't even entertain a conversation anymore. It'd be just wasting my time. It's either a man who was crucified exactly the same way as Jesus, or it's Jesus himself. Those are your options. <clears throat> Forty years ago, and it pains me to say that, in 1980, I saw a picture in National Geographic, the front cover, and it showed an orangutan and a human. And it drew my attention. And in the magazine, there's an a, a, a article titled The Mystery of the Shroud. And so this cover drew me in. I turned to the magazine, and I saw the forensics of what I knew to be true by faith. But here, science and medicine and history was telling me, this is it. This, was, this man was brutalized. So it drew me in. They call people like me shroudies. Remember Trekkies in Star Trek? They call me shroudies. Some of you are, are shroudies. I know that. <clears throat> and many were astonished at the, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. <clears throat> Some might say, well, uh, what does uh, faith have to do with science? Well, there are many Christian scientists who I doubt that scientific uh, professionals would denigrate Sir Isaac Newton, Nicholas Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Calvin, Da Vinci. Many scientists, famous, were also Christians and believers. The fields of study in shroud research, forensic pathology, chemistry, physics, botany, hematology, it goes on and on. It's the most studied object in human history. Let me repeat that. You might not have heard it. The Shroud of Turin is the most studied object in human history. Now, when we look at this cloth, we have to examine the words of Scripture and when we examine the words of Scripture, it details the weapons that were used uh, to crucify Christ. And if we look at the wounds of the man in the shroud, we see that the weapons that were used to kill him were Roman, and they match the Word of God. Now, what I would ask you today is to be intellectually honest with the information I'm going to give you. There are many people out there who say, uh, my mind's made up, don't confuse me with the facts. Okay? Well... <laughs> I'm going to ask you to be intellectually honest with the information I give you this, uh, this afternoon. Yves Delage and intellectual honesty. You might ask the question, who's Yves Delage? I'm glad you did. I'd like to tell you. Yves Delage in 1902 was with his brother scientists in, in Paris, and they were having a discussion about the Shroud of Turin. Because four years earlier in 1898, the first photograph of the Shroud was taken. And it was then that the discovery of the photographic properties of the Shroud uh, were discovered. And so they were talking about this picture in 1898 and how the shroud itself is a negative, and when you photograph it, you get a positive in the darkroom of your laboratory. And so here's what he had to say, because he said it was Christ, and they went nuts, okay? And so he said, if it were anyone else but Christ, there would be no contention. A religious question has been needlessly injected onto a problem, problem which in itself is purely scientific, with the result that feelings have run high and reason has been led astray. If, instead of Christ, there were a question of some person like a Sargon, an Achilles, or one of the pharaohs, no one would have thought of making an objection. And here's the honesty, and he was an agnostic. I recognize Christ as a historical personage, and I see no reason why anyone should be scandalized that there still exist material traces of his earthly life. Now, that's an intellectually honest statement from a courageous man. So, the shroud is 14 feet 3 inches long. It's 3 feet 7 inches wide. For the sake of this presentation, we've separated those two images so that they can be side by side for comparison for you. 14 feet 3 inches long, 3 feet 7 inches wide. Is it a coincidence that, according to Jewish measurements, the cubit, that that 14 3, 3 foot 7 measures 8 cubits by 2 cubits? Exactly. Cubic measurements that were Jewish, and why would it be uh, measured according to Jewish cubits? It was measured according to Jewish cubits, cubits for a Jewish man. So, now let me go back. What we see here is what the cloth looks like on the left. Photographic negative like. It's on the tip of the fibers. If you looked at the shroud under a microscope, you would see threads made up of fibers. A fiber is less in diameter than a hair on the back of your arm. Take a hundred of them, wrap them up, you got a thread. Look under a microscope at the threads and you see the image lies on the top two threads or three of a hundred. They've been chemically changed. 
They've been dehydrated and oxidized. If you put a newspaper in the window and the sun hits it, come back five hours later, it's yellow, prematurely aged. The same thing is what ha what's happened to the shroud. So what we have is the top two fibers have been discolored, sepia, straw-like, yellow colored. The 98 beneath are pure white. It's not a painting, it's not a forgery, it's not a hoax in any way. The blood goes through to the back side of the cloth. It causes the fibers to be cemented together. The image fibers are not cemented together. They rest on the top two or three deep into the thread, front and back. When that image is photographed, in the dark room, a positive image emerges. In 1898, when Secundo Pia took the first photograph and that image came out, he said his arm started shaking and he almost dropped the large glass plate because that face came out and he wasn't prepared for it. Now, the interesting thing is, look at the eye sockets on the left. They're white. The color, uh, the color has changed in the dark room. Now they're dark. The nose is dark and in the positive, it's white. It reverses itself. What's dark on the shroud becomes white uh, on the positive photograph. So here we see the shroud. Remember I said it's 14 feet 3 inches long, 3 feet 7 inches wide. And on, the, uh, on both sides of the image we see burn marks. It was in a fire in 1532. And uh, there are patches. Those triangular shapes are patches that were sewn on over the holes in 1534 by the poor Claire nuns of France. So here we have a ghostly image front and back of a crucified man crucified exactly the way Jesus was crucified. This man wore a helmet of thorns, not a wreath or a circle, a helmet. The full skull has been punctured, okay? Uh, what other man in history wore a crown of thorns? It was unique to Jesus, yet this man also wore a crown of thorns. Now, when we look at the comparative to the positive, what was dark, or I'm sorry, what was light here, the patches, are now dark. The body is dark. It is now light on the positive uh, of, of the uh, original. So this is what we're talking about. We can clearly see that in 1898, when that image emerged, it freaked out Secundo Pia, the backside of the cloth. Uh, again, the burn marks, the patches, and right in the center, you clearly see the image of a flogged, severely flogged man, severely flogged. And many were astonished at thee. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man. This image was put into a computer, and the computer was told to subtract everything but the blood. This is what's left. Now, real blood, type AB, by the way. Now, this thing's been folded and unfolded, rolled up and unrolled for centuries. What happens to dried blood? It flakes off and falls away. This is the blood that remains after hundreds of years. So, when we look at... The image. Underneath the right eye, you can see a large bruise and swelling. It looks like an egg. He's been beaten in the face. Parts of the beard are missing, it's been determined. He's got a full beard, full mustache, long hair down to his shoulders, parts of the beard missing. He's got a broken nose in the bridge of the nose. Now, the Bible says not a bone of him shall be broken. And if you know your anatomy, the, the, the nose is made of cartilage. It's not made of bone, so it doesn't violate the scripture. Large blood flow from the uh, number three uh, puncture wound in the forehead. And by the way, these are, these are deep puncture wounds in the skull. And you know, this is the central nervous system. Medical doctors have said when this is invaded with painful objects, you're, it's so painful that you'll, you'll uh, become unconscious. You, you can't, the human body has, is not meant to withstand the pain when the central nervous system is invaded with something like sharp thorns. So we see blood flows from the crown of thorns very clearly the back side of the head, blood flow from the crown of thorns, uh, dozens of puncture wounds. The hair must have been a bloody mess. Okay? So we see the puncture wounds in the head. The back, multiple scourge wounds on the back, between 100 and 200 flog marks, using a whip called a Roman flagrum. Uh, there are three of them that I've been able to research. Uh, one of them was made of sheep bone. Matter of fact, we, uh, we, we did something a couple years ago. We brought an exhibit here, and we made a scourge with sheep knuckles. Also broken pieces of pottery they used. The man in the shroud was scourged by two, uh, 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 actually it was a barbell shape, it looked like a barbell, with two balls at the end uh, uh, that were made of lead. And uh, this man uh, was scourged uh, viciously. Uh, between 100 and 200 strokes on both sides of his body. The only areas not scourged were the areas on the arms. I believe that the, the arm, you saw in the Passion of the Christ, he was bent over at a post. Uh, I don't think that happened to him. I think he was tied with his hands above his head because there's no scourge marks on his forearms. Uh, and um, so, uh, across 
the uh, top of the back region, there are excoriations, which suggest that he carried something heavy on the back. It wouldn't have been the full beam. That would have weighed 300 pounds. After be How he managed to carry the, sh the cross after the beating he took is, is, is unbelievable. Uh, but yet the back has been, uh, many of the wounds have been excoriated. They've been rubbed uh, uh, larger and, and, and raw because of something that was tied on to the shoulders. It was called the patibulum in Latin. Uh, and it would have weighed between 75 and 100 pounds. And the victims were tied together at the ankles. If one of them fell, they all fell like dominoes. Uh, there's, no, there, uh, there's no skin on the tip of the nose of the man in the shroud. There's no skin on the left knee. And uh, there's dirt on the left knee and the tip of the nose. There's dirt on the soles of the feet. And that dirt uh, was examined. And there's a mineral in that dirt, travertine aragonite, which comes from the limestone quarries of one place on the earth, Jerusalem. So if someone says, oh, it's a medieval forgery, well, you're going to have to ask him, how did a medieval forger, before the invention of the microscope, know to think about the possibility there might be mi microscopic particles uh, that he needs to get without being able to see them, of course, and dirt that he never knew about? The argument for a hoax is, is uh, preposterous. But he carried a heavy beam on his shoulders. Uh, if we look in the middle, right there in that box, you see a long white line. It's very possible that that's a ponytail. Uh, we believe the hair was gathered in the back. I'm going to talk about another cloth coming up here that you need to know about. If you know about the Shroud of Turin, you need to know about the Sudarium of Oviedo. And we'll talk about that, but there appears to be, in the middle of the back, uh, a ponytail. Back and shoulder abrasions from the cross. Yeah. He's got a spear wound in the side. It measures about four centimeters. Is it a coincidence that the Roman lance is about four centimeters? That's what it measures. Blood flow coming down from the wound. This is a post-mortem wound. This is a wound that appeared after death. Blood, flows, blood flowing down. Okay. Back of the shroud with blood pool from the lance. On the small of the back, above the buttocks, is a large amount of blood and fluid that came from the spear wound. Blood and water. It could have only come from the spear wound. Probably in post-mortem. Probably when they took him down from the cross, laid him horizontal or carrying him horizontal, it, whatever blood was pouring out to the small of the back. And there it is. Blood and water. Distended stomach. His stomach is swollen, which is common for someone struggling to breathe on the cross. He's got a swollen stomach. So medically, the wounds, the conditions of the man line up with what we know happens to a human body. Okay. Blood flow on the arms. Uh, two directions. Blood flow two directions. The body slumps from the weight at about 65 degrees from 90, by the way. It slumps about 65 degrees. And in order to exhale, they have to push up and pull up to exhale. And that uh, causes about a 10 degree uh, 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 separation from 65 to 55. Okay, so that's what we see. The wrist, blood flows from the nails in two directions, the directions of the raising and the slumping of the body. Okay, uh, the fingers, look at the fingers. They're only, you only see four fingers, you don't see five. Why? Because when you drive a nail through the median, uh, through the wrist, you sever the median nerve. It controls the flexion and the extension of the thumb. The reason there are no thumbs on the man in the shroud, because they're in the palm underneath. The, the nerve was most likely seriously damaged or severed. Okay, medieval forger would never have known about this. If you look at some medical publications from the Middle Ages, they look like cartoon books. They would have never known this. So, the wrist. And by the way, some say it was in the palm. You see pictures, paintings. Couldn't have been done uh, in the palm. They've actually taken cadavers, uh, unclaimed bodies, uh, you know, people, homeless perhaps, and through shroud study have crucified them through the palm to see what happens. Within minutes it rips, the body falls. Couldn't have done it through the palm. But the original language of the Bible in Hebrew, hand means fingertips to elbow. That's what hand means. And we believe the nail either went through the wrist or most likely if you take your thumb and pinky and you touch them, Right here at the base of the palm, near the wrist, you have a furrow. It's called a thenar furrow. If you drive a nail through that, see, this is an exit wound. It would come out right through the back of the wrist. <clears throat> blood flow and piercing on the back of the feet. Uh, the sole of his right foot is completely covered in blood. The left foot would have been over the right on the right instep, and one nail would have been driven through both. The uh, sole of the right foot, like I said, is completely covered in blood. Okay? You can only see partial uh, appearance of the left foot, mostly the heel, because the top half is turned inward. When he was taken off the cross, his body would have been in rigor mortis. They would have had to have broken the arms, not literally, but to, bring, to break the rigor, to bring him over the private area. Uh, so. so with all this, as in most murder mysteries, we, we ask the question, who's the victim and who done it? We think we know who the victim is, and we think we know who done it. 
One question then remains, how did the image get there? That's the question in shroud research. How did the image get there? And so Joseph of Arimathea bought fine linen and took him down from the cross and wrapped him in it and laid him in a grave which was cut out of the rock and rolled a stone to the door of the sepulcher. What is it about the shroud? Well, number one, it's fine linen. It would have been manufactured during the time of Christ, most likely in Syria or Asia Minor, minor north of Israel. That's where it would have been manufactured. So Joseph of Arimathea needed, a bolt, uh, needed to go to a bolt of cloth and cut off a piece to bury uh, Jesus. And so he went and bought fine linen. The shroud is fine linen and expensive linen that would have been manufactured in the first century. When he was taken down from the cross, this is what would have happened. They would have laid the 14-foot cloth down, would have put the body on the bottom half, took the top half, brought it over the head to the feet. And then the image was created. Now, if you go to the head and you take the cloth from the feet and you open it up, then you see the reversal of the image that's on the cloth itself. There's a reversal that takes place. So he was taken down from the cross and wrapped in fine linen. And who uh, was uh, clothed in fine linen back then? then? Priests and kings, and Jesus is both. The shroud linen. The shroud is a linen cloven, uh, cloth woven in a three over one herringbone pattern. Uh-oh. Okay. And measures four. It measures 14.3 by 3.7. These dimensions correlate with ancient Jewish measurements of 2 by 8 cubits, consistent with loom technology of the period. The finer weave of 3 over 1 herringbone is consistent with the New Testament statement that the sindon, or shroud, was purchased by Joseph of Arimathea, who was a wealthy man. The, image, uh, the images are scorch-like, yet not created by heat, and are purely surface phenomenon limited to the crown fibers, to the crowns of the top fibers. STERP, which stands for Shroud of Turin Research Project, the team that went there in 1978 to study it for six 24-hour days, they determined that the image was caused by rapid dehydration, oxidation, and degradation of the linen by an unidentified process, coloring it sepia or straw yellow. The image appears to have been created by light, ultraviolet light, it appears, as opposed to heat. All right, now, I'm going to give you history, science, and theology. I'm going to move quickly. Uh, can we take the shroud back to the tomb? We have to do that. Of all the disciplines of shroud research, the historical aspect of it is the least tied down. We have to kind of fill in the blanks along the way. So, can we take it back to the tomb? We think we can. During the time of Christ, there was a king in Edessa, which was north of Israel. It would be Syria now. Uh, and he lived, and he heard about Jesus as a healer. According to the historical record, he sent word to Jesus to come and heal him. And long story short, Jesus didn't come. He couldn't come. But, he, but an image accompanied the carrier of the message to Jesus back to Abgar, holding a cloth with a face on it, just the face. It was called a mandillion, or the image not made with human hands. In Greek, archiropoitos. And so this image, the mandillion, was called the image of Edessa. Okay? Now, What's important to know about the image of Edessa as it relates to the shroud is the image of Edessa was more uh, horizontal than it was vertical. The landscape was horizontal as opposed to vertical. There's a reason for that. There's a Greek word it was only used two times ever. That Greek word is tetra diplone. Tetra means four. Diplone means uh, folded. So it refers, there's in two, two times in the Greek language, the Mandelian, the image of Edessa, was referred to as tetradiplone. It was thought to be only a face image, but yet this, this word accompanied the image of Edessa, tetradiplone. If it's a face image in one piece of cloth, why does it have doubled in four? Well, if we look at the shroud and we double it in four, what do we get? We get a face with a uh, horizontal landscape, more horizontal than vertical. And the shroud has been uh, called tetradiplone. So we believe that the image of Edessa was the Shroud of Turin, folded up, framed, given to Abgar, probably by Jude Thaddeus, one of the 70. He was a, disi a disciple of, uh, <laughs> well, he was a disciple of somebody. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, we believe it was the Shroud folded up. That's what, that's what we believe. And if you look uh, at the Shroud and the doubling, uh, here's the fourth doubling here. And when we compare it, to what Abgar was holding, I think we can make a case, a strong circumstantial case, that they were one and the same. Now the Jews, if they grabbed the sheet of Jesus that covered him, they wouldn't have come out of the tomb saying, look what we found. Unclean. Blood. Their Jewish law says, stay away from it. Don't even touch it. But they knew something was important. Because when John went into the tomb, he said he saw and believed. Something about the burial clothes. Was there an image on it? Don't know. And it's interesting. Saw and believed. Observation, science, reason, faith, they're mutually compatible with each other. 
caused John to believe. Because the scripture says after that, they, he knew not the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Okay, let's see if we can take it then from the tomb to Turin. After the resurrection, the disciple Thaddeus, that's it, Thaddeus, uh, carries a cloth to Abgar, 30 to 50 AD. Cloth becomes known as the image of Edessa, the Mandelian, the face cloth. After Abgar's death in 50 AD, the cloth disappears due to persecution from his second son. The image of Edessa is rediscovered in 525 AD above the uh, western gate of the city of Edessa. The, the walls were, uh, it was flooded and the walls were destroyed. So in rebuilding the gate, they find this image of Edessa. From 525 onward, the image of Edessa is venerated as the face of Christ in the city of Edessa. Okay, now here we see they're rediscovering this face cloth above the western gate in 525 AD. Why is that important? It's important because up to that point, all images of Jesus were, as a, they were Roman images. They were a youthful Christ with curly hair and no beard up till the 6th century, 525. Everything changed after that. On the left, in St. Uh, Catherine's Monastery at the base of Mount Sinai in Egypt, you have a very famous Christ Pantocrator uh, painted in the 6th century. Something happened in the 6th century, 525 maybe, where this image is rediscovered. Now all of a sudden, all the paintings of Christ changed. Look at the one on the left. This is 6th century in, the, in Italy. Long hair, long nose, owlish eyes, beard. On the right, the bust of Christ, the catacombs, 8th century, long hair, owlish eyes, beard. It all changed. Something caused the change. We believe it was the rediscovery of the image of Edessa, which was the shroud folded up and disguised. That's what we believe. Uh, in the, also in the 6th century, the Emperor Justinian, uh, Byzantine emperor, he minted a coin. On the left is the coin. It's about the size of a dime. On, the back of, on, on one side was his image, his bust, and on the back side is the image of Christ on the left. When you take that backside image and you superimpose the face of the shroud on it, it all lines up, strongly suggesting that the coin and the paintings of the 6th century were influenced by the image of Edessa rediscovered above the western gate in 525. Okay, let's continue. 943, the Byzantine emperor sends his army to Edessa to rescue the cloth from the city which is now under Muslim control. Tetradiplone. Uh, when they take it back, when they take this image, this face cloth, back to Constantinople after grabbing it from the city, they said, well, look, we'll destroy this city. We'll kill all the Muslim prisoners unless you give us this cloth. And they gave it up after months of negotiation. I thought, what's to what's negotiate? You want to live? Give the cloth up. So anyway, what happened was when they took it back to Constantinople, there are historical records that talk about it being folded, and it's a long cloth, and they see a full body image. Okay, that comes out in 943. That's why we believe it's one and, one and the same. Taken to Constantinople, 943 to 1204. In 1204, Constantinople is sacked, Fourth Crusade. Uh, the image is stolen during the looting of the city. About 150 years, it's missing. We don't know what, where it was, what happened to it. In 1357, it, it's publicly exhibited at a church. It's owned by a guy named Geoffrey de Charnay. Geoffrey of Charnay. Now, there are a lot of Geoffreys of Charnay. There are a lot of Davids of Cleveland, right? There are a lot. So we don't know exactly who this man is. However, in 1204, one of the Crusader knights was named Geoffrey de Charnay. And we believe it's possible this was a relative in 1357, who was given the shroud by uh, those who took it, possibly his relative, uh, and, and, and became the owners. A hundred years later, the ownership of the shroud is transferred to Margaret de Charny, the granddaughter of Geoffrey, to the Royal House of Savoy. The Royal House of Savoy owned it from, 1570, from 1453 to 1983. The last king, um, Umberto, uh, the last uh, Italian king, he was exiled in World War II to Portugal. And when he died in 83, instead of giving it to his relatives, he willed it to the Catholic Church. Up till that time, they had been custodians for him and protectors of it because they had the means to be both. So it transfers ownership to the Savoy family in 15, or 1453. In 1532, it's in a fire. Uh, if it was a painting, it would have melted. The shroud image was untouched. Okay, if it was a painting, it would have been destroyed. Uh, 1534, the poor Claire nuns of France sewed uh, patches and a new backing cloth onto the shroud. In 2002, they took all the patches off and the backing. There are no patches now. It's cleaned up very nicely. All you see is holes and a new backing cloth. 1898, the first photograph is taken. That's when Secundo Pia discovered the photographic properties. Okay, a little history there. Let's go to science now. Here's St. John the Baptist Church in Torino. It's been there since uh, uh, 1578. So you see the quay of people waiting to get in in uh, 1978 to see this thing for about 90 seconds. Okay, uh, they unrolled it, it was wrapped in red silk, they put it on a table that rotated 360 degrees. Uh, the two gentlemen, one on the left and the one in the middle, uh, I know 
uh, especially John Jackson, who led the team in 1978. On the right there, Dr. John Jackson, Eric Jumper. They're looking at the backside of the shroud the first time in over 400 years. And they discovered, hey, the image doesn't go through to the backside. The blood goes through, it soaks through. Capillary flow, capillary action, travels up the thread. But the image rests on the top two fibers. It doesn't go underneath, OK? And very important, smoothing out the wrinkles. They said it was remarkably smooth and supple for something possibly 2,000 years old. Further examination of the underside. Uh, the gentleman on the left, Dr. Ray Rogers, he was at a low weight, kind of a, kind of a, a rinky-dink uh, laboratory called Los Alamos. That's where he worked for 40 years. He was a, uh, a, uh, a nuclear um, chemist, if you will. He built atomic bombs. And he said uh, that the carbon date that came out in 1988 declared that it's medieval. It was uh, 1260 to 1390. Three labs performed ind independent carbon dating tests on the cloth. And they concluded it dated between 1260 and 1390. It was medieval and therefore not old enough to have wrapped the body of Jesus. Their conclusion was generally accepted out around the world. Shroud research came to a screeching halt in 1988 when people, they said, many uh, uh, headlines around the world, Shroud is a hoax, Shroud is a forgery, proved to be medieval. Far from it, far from it. And so John, uh, Ray Rogers wrote a paper refuting it. And if you look on the very bottom, on the two lines that are underlined, in summing up, he says, Ray Rogers, the radiocarbon sample was thus not, not part of the original cloth and, and is invalid for determining the age of the shroud. You see, when it came time to take a sample for the testing, they took it from the most contaminated area of the cloth, uh, a, a, a decision they vowed not to do. They were supposed to take seven different samples from different, seven different sites on the cloth, giving them to seven different laboratories. Instead, they went to a side strip which may have been part of a reweave that was discovered after the testing was done. And it's also the most highly contaminated area of the cloth. And it came back medieval. Well, if it was part of a reweave from the Middle Ages, then the date is proper. But it doesn't, uh, doesn't date the main body of the cloth. It's not indicative of the main body of the cloth. So we believe the carbon date is an error. They've taken the patches off. Underneath the patches, you have a ton of material, charred material, debris that could be retested uh, uh, using the carbon dating technique. However, for the last, since 88, the Vatican has refused, despite many attempts by researchers, some of whom I'm, I know, to, to say, look, here's a proposal to retest it. They haven't done it yet. OK, this is my younger brother. Uh, that's a joke. That's a joke now. Come on, this is, a, this is a deep subject here. Let's laugh a little bit. Anyway, I'm holding in my hand sticky tape samples that were lifted off the surface of the shroud. In 1973 and in 1978, Max Fry, Dr. Max Fry from Switzerland, he was the head of their crime lab, like the FBI, uh, he put scotch tape on the shroud, lifted it off, and then mounted it on microscopic slides. And what you do with that is you've lifted off evidence from caught between the, the threads and, and, and the fibers. You lift it off, it's, it's on the adhesive of the tape, and you look at it under a microscope. In 1999, I was in Dr. Alan Wanger and his wife Mary's home and in their basement. I was able to look at the actual samples lifted off the surface of the shroud uh, using electron microscope. Uh, this is a sample of the Gundalia turniforti specimen, the thorn specimen that is seen on the shroud in the head region, uh, which only comes from Jerusalem. This is an example of, uh, of those uh, thorn plants. And this is very important. Under the electron microscope, this image came up. This is a thorn pollen image. Look around it. You can see the spines. This is microscopic. How could a medieval forger have ever known that? This is a very important picture, and it happens to be mine. Not many have this. Uh, it's blood, real blood. It was discovered by two uh, men. Dr. John Heller went to a place called Western Reserve University before it became case for his master's degree. And, John, uh, and Alan Adler, they discovered it's real blood, type AB blood, which is uh, very uncommon in the world, except the Jewish race in the Middle East, about 18 to 20 percent of the Jewish people in the Middle East are type AB blood. Okay, so when we look at a slide, this is a slide lifted off the surface of the shroud. You see a thorn pollen at the top, you see a blood speck in the lower right, and then you see a fiber shard. Okay? All right, now. The chemical signature of the shroud sample and the tomb limestone were found to be identical except for minute fragments of cellulose linen fiber that could not be separated uh, from the shroud samples. So here's the foot. It, on the shroud itself, it's the left foot, but in reality, in the photograph, it's really the right foot. It was against the beam. 
completely covered in blood. The left foot was over the right. Uh, and they would uh, take a shallow breath in this position and have to pull up and push up in order to exhale. You know, the man in the shroud was buried in a fine piece of linen. They didn't do that to crucifixion victims. What they did was they took their bodies and threw them on a pile outside the city. That's what they did. Or they let the victim hang on the cross until wild beasts came in from the fields and devoured them, birds of prey landing on them, insects burrowing into uh, holes in the body. This is what, what was done to the worst of the worst. worst. Yet this man was buried in a fine piece of linen. Dirt particles on the nose, the left knee, and feet come from the limestone quarries of Jerusalem. Specific limestone signature, travertine aragonite. That's amazing. Okay, what does it not have? It doesn't have any organic pigments present. No substances manually applied to the cloth. No artistic substances detected, like paint. No binder cementing the fiber. The only thing cementing the fiber is the blood. No brush strokes. No stains, no dyes, or artificial medium created this image. Here we have a, a three-dimensional uh, image of the man in the shroud, and you can clearly see on the right one, look at the calf muscles. Look at how, how uh, uh, protruding they are. Look at the knees and the legs on the left. You can see knees. You can see uh, shin bones. Okay, this thing stands out. It's three-dimensional. It has, it has height, width, and depth. It has depth per perception. Wherever created this image, and we believe it was light, it, uh, it acted in an instant, um, and it created three-dimensional information. There's, al there's also holographic information on here. Uh, they can make a hologram here. Now, I've done, I don't know anything about holograms, but I've done a little studies, and I know you need laser beams to make a hologram. They intersect. And so this is holographic. So there are obviously lasers. Uh, uh, radiation, we believe, is, is part of it. So uh, button-like objects over the eyes. Now, a number of years ago, I said these were Roman coins. We're not sure. So I'm not going to say they're Roman coins. But there are things over the eyes to keep the lids closed in depth. A 3D computer-generated face. Now, on the left, you see the half of the face with the damage. On the right, you see the face without the damage. You're about to see an image that is only the face without damage to it. I believe it's the next one. Yeah. Now, I'll get a drink of water while you look at that. One of the amazing things about the Shroud of Turin is, in spite of all the damage, that's brutal. More medical doctors have said they've never seen a human being more damaged than the man in the Shroud. And in spite of all that damage, you don't see a death mask like you would see during World War II Holocaust victims just before death, or after death, rather. You'd see the torture, the horror on their face of what they suffered. You don't see that on the man in the Shroud. Why? Because he's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the prince of, and that's what we see on the Shroud of Turin. And there appeared an angel to him. Okay, we went through history and science. Now we're moving into theology. And there appeared an angel to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I have the word hematidrosis in parentheses. Hematidrosis, bloody sweat. This is a medical condition. They've seen it in the Holocaust victims, people who know they're about to die. You see this where the capillaries burst on the inside, and they mix with the sweat glands, and you literally sweat blood. They saw it in World War II, Holocaust victims who knew they were about to die. This happens when you're doomed. When you're doomed and yet there's nowhere to go, and you're going to die, you're going to sweat blood, and that's what happened to Jesus in the garden. No resistance whatsoever. This is the amazing thing about the man in the shroud. We can look at all the wounds, and we find there's no defensive struggle. No attempt to fight back or defend himself. No fight or flight response. And that's the normal thing. Someone scourging you, or gonna gra you're going to want to get away. And we would see that on the man's body if it happened. What person in history wouldn't fight back? I can think of one. Scourged and condemned. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas uh, unto them and delivered Jesus when he scourged him to be crucified. Barabbas. Interesting name. Bar means son of. This came to me a few years ago. The son of the father, Bar Abba, is released in place of capital, the son of the father. That's an amazing thing. It's not coincidence, by the way. So he was flogged to a pillar, I believe, with his hands above his head, unable to, to defend himself, uh, lashed mercilessly, the man in the shroud. Lashed mercilessly. Now, they did flog prior to crucifixion, but they never did it as badly as they did it to the man in the shroud. Remember, Pilate wanted to release Jesus. So he said, hey, flog him up. Make it good, so maybe that'll do. It, it didn't, didn't work, obviously. The flagrum. Lead handle, leather strips, barbell-shaped balls of lead. Probably jagged. 
barbell balls of lead. They probably roughed him up a little bit. And on the cloth, you see two barbell-shaped wounds. This is what he was flogged with. And they clothed him with purple, plated a crown of thorns, put it about his head, and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. This was a full helmet. This wasn't a wreath or a circle. Remember, they beat it onto him. They beat it into his central nervous system. Medical doctors have said the human could not have withstood this pain. And yet, we know he did. The patibulum, the heavy beam, the crossbar used in the crucifixion, facial injuries, tip of nose abrasion and broken nose, maybe from the fall, unable to break the fall. The hole in the wrist we see at the base in the thenar furrow, and we see uh, it go through the wrist, severing the median nerve. You can see the two flows of blood from the exit wound on the wrist matching the pulling up and the slumping, the 65 and 55 degree uh, position of the body on the cross, and the four fingers with no thumbs. The feet, the uh, left instep was on the right instep, uh, one nail through both. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it's melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. A potsherd is a piece of broken pottery in the dirt. Okay, I am poured out like water, seriously dehydrated. He lost uh, fluid in the garden, sweat and blood. Okay, how many are all my bones? How many are all? All his bones were out of joint. And my tongue cleaves to my jaws. You have brought me into the dust of death, for dogs have encompassed me. The, wicked, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. Notice Psalm 22. This was spoken by David a thousand years before crucifixion. Okay? They pierced my hands and my feet. Then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first and the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they didn't break his legs. But one of the soldiers, with a spear, pierced his side, and immediately there came out blood and water. The spear wound is between the fifth and the sixth rib. It would have went into the right atrium, which after death fills up with blood, post-mortem. So when, he went, when that spear went through the fifth and sixth rib, it pulled out water from the pleural cavity of the lungs and also blood, both seen on the small of the back. Why? Because these things were done that the scripture, and there they are, should be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall be broken. Then comes Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and saw the linen cloths lying there and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw science and believed faith. Observation, belief. Now, I want to draw your attention to where it says, and the napkin that was about his head. Earlier I said, if you know about the shroud, you got to know about the Sudarium of Oviedo, Oviedo, Spain. The Sudarium uh, comes from the New Testament word for napkin. We believe, it says it was about his head. We believe it was a hood placed over the Lord's head in death. You don't look at a corpse. You don't gaze at a face. There's nothing dignified about it. They did it back then. They do it today. You cover the face. We believe the Sudarium was a hood placed around the head of the Lord. Why is that important? It doesn't have an image. It just has blood stains, type AB blood stains. It also has po a pollen trail. Where's the pollen trail? Israel, uh, Syria. You remember the image of Edessa? Uh, Constantinople, that's where it was taken, or the shroud was. And uh, so the pollen trail of the shroud, match, or the sudarium, matches the pollen trail of the shroud. Also the blood uh, type matches. We believe they're one and the same. When you take that image and you superimpose it over the face of the shroud, you have them lining up perfectly, strongly suggesting that they wrap the same head, the sudarium of Oviedo. Okay? And when they got to the tomb, they took it off, wrapped it up, folded it up, put it over here. Now real quickly, I want to say this, in Jewish uh, meals, when the master of the house, say during the Passover, got up from a meal, and he was returning to the meal, maybe he was going to use the restroom, I don't know, uh, he would fold up his napkin and place it over here. The servant would come and say, oh, that's folded, he's coming back. Jesus folded the napkin in the tomb. Blood on the sudarium, when analyzed type AB, no, traces of pollen uh, on the sudarium correspond to the historical route of the shroud. And there it is, and we see the large flow of blood and fluids coming from the mouth and nose, uh, which is how it would have appeared on the, on the face of the man in the shroud. Then he said to Thomas, reach hither your finger, and behold my hands, reach hither thy hand, thrust it into my side, be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed. Like Thomas, there will be a day when our faith becomes sight. Does the shroud of Turin enable us to see our faith? Characteristics of image formation. Real quickly, I haven't talked yet about how the image was formed. I'm going to give you a couple of things real quickly. Well, the image is a three-dimensional hologram. Uh, it's been duplicated uh, very 
tenuously, if you will, the, the, uh, the color around a fiber, just like the shroud, has been duplicated by scientists in Italy. What did it take? It took laser beams at 1 40 billionth of a second in duration at three to five, uh, 2 to 5 billion watts of power. That created the same coloration on a fiber as the shroud image. That kind of power. Particle radiation at the subatomic level, uh, particle radiation increases the level of carbon content. So if this thing was, was irradiated with light at the resurrection, it would have added to the carbon content, making a, sh a, a dating younger than it actually is. Particle radiation enriches the brightness of the red color. Many have said the blood is too bright. It can't be real. It should be black or dark. But when you're tortured, uh, the body breaks down in the blood uh, a, a chemical uh, that's called bilirubin that creates a, a bright red color in the blood. The reason it's bright red on the shroud is because the man was tortured. Light source came from the body itself. It's not reflected light. The blood projected outward and lifted cleanly away from the body. The blood intersected with the falling cloth. It's very possible that the body was levitating. Very possible. With the cloth pulled taut, top and bottom, the cloth would have fell through and up into the radiant zone of the body. It wouldn't have fallen into it very much. Only the top couple fibrils were radiated and created the image. Uh, the blood was on the cloth before the image was formed because they've cleaned the blood and have not seen any image. The blood was there first before the image. Now, if it was a painting, if it was an artist, they would draw the image and then put the blood in last, wouldn't they? This was, the blood was on there first. No body decomposition. Collimated radiation, perpendicular to the body, straight up and straight down. The body suspended between the upper and lower cloth. It might have been levitating. The same color on the entire cloth. On the back side of the shroud, you had 180 pounds plastered to it. And on the top side of the shroud, uh, body, you only had the cloth resting on the top. Yet the color is the same with 180 pounds plastered on it and the top. Body vanished beneath the falling cloth, and there's a cloth to distance body correlation. Whatever created the image acted through space over time. Not a lot of space, not a lot of time. It is suggested the image was formed when a high energy particle struck the fiber and released radiation within the fiber at a speed greater than the local speed of light. That's Kevin Moran. I knew him. He was an optical engineer with Kodak. We can conclude now that the shroud image is that of a real human form of a scourged and crucified man. It is not the product of an artist. Blood stains are composed of hemoglobin, also give a positive test for serum albumin. The image is an ongoing mystery, and until further chemical studies are made, perhaps by this group of scientists or perhaps by sometimes scientists in the future, the problem remains unsolved. That was quoted in 1981, and it's still uh, stands true today. So whom do you say I am? A mere man or the Lamb of God? The man in the shroud asks. Well, just as uh, Abraham was going to offer Isaac, uh, Jesus was called the Lamb of God. He became the sacrifice. And this is the record that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life. He that th doesn't have the Son of God does not have life. And he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment of our peace was on him and with his stripes were healed. Here's the key. To as many as received him, he gave them power to become the children of God, even to, the, to them that believe on his name. You have to be born again. God, the reason we're here is God wants us to be born the first time. Amen? He wants that right for every human being. Once we're born and we each reach the age of accountability, there's another birth that needs to take place. We need to be born again within our heart. And all that means is we see th things through the lens of Scripture. That's what it means, that your heart is changed. Spiritual EKG, God, Jesus said, there are some people who honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. What does God require of us? A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Uh-oh. Few more, ground zero, Calvary and the, and the cross. This came out of uh, ground zero, by the way, this cross. We need to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God the Father. What was his joy? You. You were his joy. Purchasing your salvation. That's what gave him joy. Here's C.S. Lewis. A few more slides. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him, kill him as a demon, or fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let's not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Jesus says to us, let's reason. Though your sins are as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they'll be as wool. Those scriptures are written into the cloth. 
If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you're saved, period. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord is saved. When I saw this image on the right at a conference in St. Louis, I looked at that face on the right and I gasped. I said, that's a lion, I said to myself. That's a lion. So what do we have on the shroud? We have the lamb on linen and we have the lion of Judah. Why is that important? It's important because Jesus is returning, but he's not returning as the lamb. Why? Because he's the lion king. And that's it. Thank you for your kind attention. God bless all of you.